You see, whenever God has a plan, the devil works in the darkness trying to thwart it. Where there is Jesus Christ, the devil has the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist working. Where God had a plan for mankind in the Garden of Eden, here came the serpent to work in opposition. So you see, at times, some people have to be removed from our lives because they are being used by the devil. But you see, God always wins. God's will will always prevail. So regardless of what the devil plots and plans, God's divine plan for our lives is what will prevail. Why does God remove people from your life? Well, there are several reasons why. The first is what I would like to call addition by subtraction. There are instances where God has to remove someone from your life so that he can enlarge your territory. A story is told of a pastor who had been called to take over a small congregation. This was a church that had less than a hundred members, but when he got there, he encountered great difficulty. A lot of people were difficult to work with. A lot of people were fighting him as he tried to do the work of God. And so this pastor and his wife prayed and fasted, asking the Lord for direction. Now the Lord opened his eyes and spoke to his heart, and it came to light that there was a lot of division in and among the members of this church. But there was a core group that stirred up a lot of the division in that church. Now the pastor worked hard and through prayer, this group of about 20 members left one by one as they didn't agree with the changes that the pastor was enforcing. After that core group left, the congregation was even smaller. It nearly halved. But with those that remained, there was a sweet spirit that began to cover that church. Those that were left were united. They became a church that prayed together, a church that loved one another, but more importantly, they became a church that genuinely sought after the presence of God. Within a year, the church grew to from just about 50 members to over 300. That congregation continued to grow until they had over a thousand members. Now, the lesson here is that some people had to go because they were hindering the work of God and they had to leave. When it looked like the church was losing, it looked like the church was shrinking, but God was in fact working to uproot the weeds that were hindering his church. How about in our lives? Who are the people that God needs to subtract in your life so that he can enlarge your territory? Who are some of the people that are hindering God's work within your life? Who is it that's holding you back? Be careful that you are not holding on to people who God wants to subtract from your life. God can remove people from your life because he wants you to grow, because he wants you to flourish in him. Now, moving on, God can and often does remove people from our lives in order to fulfill his plan. When we give our lives to God, we are giving him permission to do his will in our lives. Therefore, anything or anyone that comes in the way of fulfilling God's plan in your life, he will remove. God can see down the corridors of time, but more accurately, God has already been to the end and the beginning and knows every single thing that's going to happen in your life. You see, whenever God has a plan, the devil works in the darkness trying to thwart it. Where there is Jesus Christ, the devil has the Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist working. Where God had a plan for mankind in the Garden of Eden, here came the serpent to work in opposition. So you see, at times, some people have to be removed from our lives because they are being used by the devil. But you see, God always wins. God's will will always prevail. So regardless of what the devil plots and plans, God's divine plan for our lives is what will prevail. The third reason why God may remove someone from your life is because that person or that relationship is a distraction. For someone who's in a toxic relationship, you'll find that they are so consumed by the drama in their life that they can't focus their energy anywhere else, let alone prayer. 
A toxic person in your life can also influence you to do evil. The Apostle Paul wrote, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company often brings trouble. So the Lord, in His wisdom, in His love and mercy, the Lord will remove someone that we might not even realize is dragging us down. Let's say you had a car and something wasn't quite right with it. You would take it to a mechanic so that he could look over it. Well, the Lord looks over us. The Lord looks over our lives and sees all of the problems that some people cause in our lives. And the best remedy at times is for him to remove them. All in all, we need to trust God. The Lord has a purpose for everything that happens in our lives. And for us as his children, we need to trust Him because He is in control and He knows what He is doing. He allows both good and bad things to take place for the fulfillment of His divine plan. We come across many people in our lifetimes. Friends for a season. Friends for a lifetime. Acquaintances and colleagues that we have reasonable relationships with. But here's the thing. The devil is an evil devil. If he cannot infiltrate and invade by force, he will do it by deception and inadvertently through your consent. And one of the ways that he will try and get you to consent unknowingly is through our network of relationships. If the devil can plant someone into your inner circle, then he knows that he has a good chance of influencing you to do the wrong thing. He knows that you're much more likely to be receptive when someone close to you is encouraging you to do the wrong thing. Even more so if that person is helping, assisting, and enabling you to do the wrong thing. And so the thing is, you need to be alert to the signs that someone in your life may be planted by the devil in order to get you to push or pull you away from walking with the Lord. Now, the first sign you should look for is probably the most obvious, and that is the person who encourages you to do wrong. The enemy will always plant people or a person who encourages and cheers you on. This is the type of person who encourages you to go to places that you know you have no business going to. This is the type of person that edges you on. Oh, there's nothing wrong with a little fun every once in a while, they'll say. Stop being so uptight. Stop being such a holy roller. One drink won't make you a sinner. This person is a dangerous person. They are a threat to your salvation. The Amplified Translation for 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 to 34 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Be sober-minded. Be sensible. Wake up from your spiritual stupor as you ought and stop sinning. For some of you have no knowledge of God. You are disgracefully ignorant of Him and ignore His truths. I say this to your shame. How does bad company corrupt good morals, you ask? Well, they encourage you to do the wrong thing. They encourage you to sin. They try and get you to compromise your integrity. They are the sort of person who will tell you things like, it's okay once in a while. But be warned, this is the type of bad company that corrupts. They push and pull you to sin, and as children of God, once we identify such people in our lives, we need to separate ourselves from them. Now, the second sign that someone in your life has been planted by the devil is that they try to control and manipulate you. Think of it this way. God Almighty, in His wisdom, in His majesty and glory, He does not control you. He does not forcefully make you do anything. The Holy Spirit may convict you, but conviction in the heart and manipulation are two very different things. Now, when you find someone who attempts to control you, that person is being used of the devil. God has given you a free will. He has given you the ability and capability to make choices. And any time that someone else tries to take that away from you, any time that someone attempts to impose their will upon you, they are being used of the devil. If you look throughout the Bible, you will see that anyone who had this spirit of control was used by the devil. Jezebel had this controlling spirit. 
Nebuchadnezzar had this spirit. In fact, it was so strong on him that he built a golden statue of himself and demanded that everyone would bow down and worship it. And when three Hebrew boys by the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused, he had them cast into a furnace. That is a wicked and controlling spirit. If you identify this spirit in anyone within your inner circle, I encourage you to move away. Separate yourself. That's how you will be protected. The third sign that someone is sent by the devil is what I'd like to call the enabler. The enabler is really used by the enemy because this person goes beyond encouraging you to sin. They go beyond manipulating you to sin. They provide the resources for you to sin. The enabler will give the addict money to feed their habit. The enabler will invite the married man to an event with single women and help him to lie to his wife that he'll be out of town for a few days because of work. If you're a person given to lust, the enabler will make it possible for you to act out that lust. The enabler will facilitate. They will provide the resources and everything needed for you to do what you are not meant to do and be where you are not meant to be. The enabler is a dangerous person because they make it possible for you to sin. And Jesus gave a very stern and serious warning to those who enable others to sin. Here's what Mark chapter 9 verse 42 says. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe and trust in me to stumble, that is to sin or lose faith, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone, one requiring a donkey's strength to turn it, were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Those are strong words to illustrate the severity of punishment that would follow if someone leads others to sin. So be careful. Assess your inner circle. Is there anyone who enables you to sin? Because if there is, that's not the sort of person you should be around. Now, the final type of person you need to avoid is the discourager. The discourager is one who pulls you away from God. They make you question God. The discourager might not necessarily enable you to sin or encourage you to sin, but here's what they'll do. They'll talk you out of joining that Bible study group on Wednesday. They'll talk you out of attending that prayer meeting. They'll give you a thousand and one reasons why you should watch the game or attend this event, and they'll tell you how missing one service won't hurt you. This is the type of bad company you don't want around you. The discourager will question your pastor. They present the case of how church is all about profit. They will highlight how church people treat you. Everything negative, they'll pick up on it. And so be aware. Be careful of this type of person. They will never tell you that there is no perfect church. They will never tell you that if you keep missing and neglecting your prayer life, then you will not progress as a Christian. You will be powerless as a Christian. So overall, I pray that you will be vigilant against people who encourage you to sin, enable you to sin. Stay away from these types of people. Evil company corrupts good habits. Pray that God would expose every single individual that's been planted by the enemy in your life. But especially, pray that God would lead you to people who are strong in faith so that you can strengthen each other and encourage each other in the things of the Lord. The Bible makes plenty of references about the types of people you should not be around. And before I go any further, take a moment to answer the question, would God approve of everyone that's in my circle of influence? Psalm 1 verse 1 paints a clear picture when speaking of the kinds of people who should be in our lives because the Bible says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. There's so much wisdom and guidance in this single verse when you really examine it. A person is blessed when they are diligent about who they walk with, which path they stand on, and which seat they sit on. So ask yourself the following questions about those around you. Who am I walking with? Which path am I standing on? And where am I sitting? Now, who are the ungodly people you need to be watchful of? Those who are morally wrong, those who are actively bad, those who are wicked or unjust. Your faith, your salvation is a precious thing 
that you have to guard and nurture. For you to walk under the counsel of the ungodly, you are putting your faith and salvation at risk. Now, this teaching is not to say you cannot or should not interact with unbelievers. No, on the contrary, we should minister to them and show them the love of God. However, the Bible makes it clear that it is not advisable to walk under their counsel, which means their advice or guidance. That's the key part to understand. It's not advisable to do so, and we are told many times. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Everyone you come across has a certain character. Some have a bad character and exhibit toxic traits, while others are the complete opposite and have a sound, godly character. These are the people who will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. They will encourage you, pray with you, show you a godly love, and they will have a sweet spirit. At the end of the day, we need to be people who are prayerful and discerning because we have to guard ourselves. You cannot just allow anyone to walk into your life. Look at their character. Study their character because in one way or another, they will have an impact on you. People can have an impact on you. Some people are honest while others are deceitful. Some are trustworthy while others are liars. Some have a great work ethic while others are slackers. Your character will influence those around you for good or for evil. And likewise, the character of those closest to you will influence you for good or for evil. So here's the thing. Whoever you decide to walk with, to form a friendship with, refuse to be led astray. Refuse to be influenced. Refuse to be led away from the truth and into error and sin. It's a one-way street when we associate with evil people. And that one-way street takes you from purity to defilement. That one-way street will take you from holiness to sin, from darkness to light, from worth and value to corruption and decay. When it comes to who we should and shouldn't associate with, the Bible is clear. We are told not to be yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship does righteousness and wickedness have? Or what fellowship can light and darkness have? What harmony is there between Christ and the devil? Saints of God, we are to come out from among them and be separate. Everyone you walk with, there's some level of relationship. Everything you walk with, there is also a purpose to. And if you look in the lives of men and women today, you'll find that people walk in agreement with different kinds of people. Some choose to walk with those who are ambitious and career driven. Some choose to hold on to childhood friends, even though their lives are heading in very different directions. Others choose to walk in the counsel of the wicked, following their advice and example. But here's the thing. There are others who choose to walk with their heads held high. They are proud of what they've achieved, proud of their accomplishments and their success. Then there are those who choose to walk with their heads looking down, they are ashamed of the past. They are ashamed and scarred even by what they've done. And at the core of all these examples, I'm trying to provoke you. I'm trying to challenge you to look at yourself and do an assessment. Who are you walking with? Who are you in the presence of? Or for some, what are you walking with? and carrying around. If we become the average of our top five friends, 
Imagine what we would become if we surround ourselves with five people who love the Lord deeply. 1 Timothy 6 verse 11 says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Paul here is writing a letter directly to Timothy. That's why he calls him a man of God. However, what Paul says applies to both men and women. We should surround ourselves with people who are pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. As they pursue those things, so will we. The question becomes for you, who am I surrounding myself with? Who you surround yourself with becomes who you become. If you surround yourself with people with poor attitudes about God, it's very easy to adapt those attitudes for yourself. However, if you surround yourself with people who point to God, you will also. If you surround yourself with people who have poor habits, such as not reading the Word and lacking a prayer life, you will adopt those habits as well. But if you surround yourself with people who read the Word daily and pray often, you will as well. One bad apple can spoil the rest. However, a bunch of good apples protects each other from spoiling. One of the best ways to set yourself up for a godly life is surrounding yourself with others who are living a godly life. Let's take a look at the browsing history on your laptop. Will some of the sites you frequent be like bad friends? Would they encourage you to be holy and focused on a righteous God? Or the opposite? How's your Netflix account? What sort of mood? Remember who you are, saints of God. The devil is busy and wants to eliminate you however he can. It is so easy to fall into the trap of negativity and toxic experiences. It's all around us every day, from the songs we hear on the radio to the evil things that come on television. It infiltrates our home, work, and ears, sometimes before we can even catch it. It latches onto us like a parasite sucking the very essence of God's glory from us. It can make you feel sick, depressed, or even angry. Pay attention to what is taking up space in your life and causing toxic vibes. One of the most remarkable things that Jesus said while he was here on this earth can be found in John 15, verse 15. The Bible reads, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. When I read this verse, I think back to when I was a young man and I first heard the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It was one of those songs that lifted me up during a very discouraging season in my life. Allow me for a moment to just recite the lyrics to this uplifting song. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear, and what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Now, let us pray. Lord Jesus, my hope is in you. My faith is in you. My trust is in you. When I feel anxious, I pray that the Holy Spirit would teach me to cast my burdens on Jesus. Teach me to lean on the Lord for strength. Teach me not to carry the load by myself, but remind me that in Jesus, I have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Jesus, I have a God who has said, come to me, 
All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Give me rest in your arms, Lord. Take away everything that tries to discourage me. If I should fall, pick me up, Lord. If I should get knocked down, lift me up, Lord. Lord, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice. Those who are discouraged, those who are tired and weary. I pray that they may know you to be the God who restores and resurrects. May they find you to be a God who renews and revives. Father, your word in Psalm 18, verse 1 to 6, encourages me as it reads, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torments of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. You are God who helps me in my distress. When I cry out, you hear my cry, and you are the good shepherd who rescues me. Lord, I am reaching out to you because you are the one who controls all things and rules over all things. You know my beginning from my end. You know that which strengthens me and what my weakness is. Lord Jesus, I cannot face this life without you. You are the one who helps me to overcome. You are the one who lifts me up from a pit of despair. I will trust in you forever because your word in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 to 8 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when he comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. My heart does safely trust in you, King Jesus, because you mean for me to lie down in green pastures and you lead me beside still waters. You restore my soul. And for this I give you thanks and offer praises up to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So, for the believer in today's world, we live in a world that's sinful, a world that glorifies sin. It's spiritually dark and morals are, well, they're out the window. Pleasure, pride, and selfish gain, those are the primary things that determine a lot of people's actions. Now you may wonder, as we live in such a world, how can you and I walk with the Lord? How can we walk with Him in habitual fellowship? How can we walk with Him in obedience? The Bible tells us to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness. The Bible tells us not to walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So, in order for us to truly walk with the Lord, we need to turn our backs on the world and on what it has to offer. We need to turn away from things, turn away from anything that sidetracks you from walking with Jesus. Turn away from everything that tries to derail you from walking with Jesus. Turn away from sin and walk with Jesus. Do whatever it takes. 
even if it means being mocked and ridiculed. Do whatever it takes, even if it means suffering and being considered an outcast. Because although the cost is great, the reward is even greater. There is no greater cause for which to give your life than Jesus Christ. Count the cost and you will see that what you gain is worth far more than anything you could give up. Jesus gives you a joy that doesn't depend on your circumstances. He gives you love like you've never known. He gives your life purpose and meaning. But most importantly, He gives you an eternity of glory that will outlast any wealth or fame you could ever have on this earth. That's the reward that awaits us if we take up our cross and do whatever it takes to follow Him. So there is no losing when you have Jesus. David said in Psalm 139 verse 8, If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. In other words, God is always there. He's there when life seems heavenly, and he's there when it feels like you're going through hell. He's there when you don't have a care in the world. And he's there when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You simply cannot break a person who is in Christ. Jesus can bring change to the worst of circumstances. He can speak calm to the worst of storms in your life. And so your security, our security as children of God is in knowing that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. So have faith that your steps are ordained. Your steps are ordered by the hand of the Lord. You can't be broken, child of God. You can't. I had to look deep at what was holding me back. I had to find those things and really say, I'm leaving you behind so that I can follow Jesus. Anything draining and everything toxic had to go. Any bitterness from the failures of the past, all the hurt and the pain, I had to leave it all behind. And I want to encourage you to do the same too. Take your marriage to another level, believing God for a complete turnaround. If it's a job or your finances, Tell God about it and believe he will make a way. If it's your health and you need healing, tell God about it. If you're stuck in some bad circumstance, tell God about it. And if you're encouraged, that's good. But that's not to say you won't come face to face with challenging tests. But even so, don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. Don't waver to the left or to the right. God's not going to leave you out to dry. He won't leave you alone. But like the book of Joshua chapter 1 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with you, so keep your eyes on him, and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Bible never said that because we are Christians, no trial or challenge will come our way. Rather, it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. In short, we are told to expect trials. Don't look at them like they are strange happenings. And we are also not to judge God's love for us by the things that happen or don't happen in our lives. 
And so, beloved, the God we serve is one who turns things around for the good of those who love and trust Him. We serve a God that turns threat to triumph. A God that took Joseph from the prison to the palace. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Paul said in the book of Philippians, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Meaning if there's a breath in his body, it's because Jesus sustains me. It's because Jesus Christ strengthens me. And if I'm absent from this body, then I am present in eternity with Christ. God will dry your tears. He will be a bridge over troubled water. He will be sunshine on a rainy day. Your strength in the moments that you feel weak. So raise your head and don't slump your shoulders. You're God's child. You have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. There ain't a devil that can break you. There isn't a situation that can break you because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Should you need healing, submit to the Lord's will. And if you receive healing, that's wonderful. If you don't, then do not be disheartened because perhaps there is a purpose for you to go through what you're going through. Have an attitude that says, Lord, whatever your decision may be, I'm going to trust in you. May your will be done. May your will take precedence over my life. Healing is something that we all need in our lives. Physical healing, emotional healing, or mental healing, whatever it may be. Jesus Christ still heals today. He still makes people whole today. Jesus Christ still mends broken hearts. He can divinely rehabilitate you. He can revive the dead things in your life. Jesus Christ can soothe every painful scar in your life. He is the master physician. He's a chief doctor who is able to treat every visible and invisible wound in your life.